from the McCourtney Institute for Democracy on the campus of Penn State University. I'm Michael Berkman. And I'm Chris Beam, and this is Democracy Works. Who do we have today, Chris? Michael, today we have uh, Joyce Ladner. Uh, she is has a PhD in sociology from Wash University in St. Louis, uh, had a number of academic appointments, including interim president at Howard University. Uh, but the reason we wanted to talk to her is because she is uh, part of history. She was an amazing, has an amazing uh, background in the civil rights movement and knew a lot of people that are just iconic in American history. Yeah, in fact, that's why, she, that's why she's here. The Africana Research Center, which is uh, part of the College of the Liberal Arts at Penn State, invited her in to talk about her life in the civil rights movement and uh, our appreciation to them for helping to arrange uh, for her to stop by the studios of WPSU and chat with us. Today. Yeah, it just is just amazing. You know, we all kind of walk through history, but this woman was was there. She was there at the March on Washington. She was a childhood friend of Megar Evers. The, yeah, uh, really excited to. Yeah, hear it's what amazing. Just today. amazing. It is for our purposes really interesting to think about the civil rights movement as uh, a kind of iconic moment in American democracy and how this movement grew from organizing into churches, bus boycotts, reaction to um, violence in the South and ended with, um, with Voting Rights Act and the Civil Rights Act, just two of the most important um, right, ended with, milestones. Ended with monumental policy right. changes. Mm -hmm. uh, Voting Rights Act, I think in particular, uh, because it gave African Americans right. political power. Mm -hmm. I mean, one of the things that's so interesting about the Civil Rights Movement and their whole strategy, which was really centered around uh, protest and the courts, uh, was because they had no uh, they had no political power. Right. They had no seats in Congress. They had very few seats in state legislatures. And very they, few people could even and vote. They couldn't really vote. Right. Yeah, so uh, so their really on, only opportunity to uh, to influence uh, what's happening was uh, was through the civil disobedience and, and through the courts, right. which you know, which she wasn't all that involved with. So mm -hmm. that's not mm -hmm. really our conversation today. She was much more involved with what was going on in the protest movements and what the NAACP was. It is easy in you know fifty years past to just forget. Um, how dangerous it was to be a civil rights worker and how how um, terrifying it yes. was to take on this kind of um, mantle of, of, of protest in a, in a world that was where all the, the structures, all the powers were uh, lined up against you and they were all more than willing to use violence to stop you. Right. Um, and we are all, all of us Americans are just better off for their, as a result of their courage. Yes, and I, and I you know, the, the civil rights movement, the uh, civil rights movement around race in the 1950s and 60s is often pointed to as the sort of quintessential social movement in the United States because of the way that it sort of brings together a variety of organizations, uh, activism in the streets that then is intended to lead to eventual governmental action, but also that it keeps on going. And, and one of the things that the organizations become institutionalized, they continue to persist, uh, they continue to fight fight struggles. And of course, the civil rights movement continues to go on today. Well, and... and, and a, a, a range of issues from voting rights, police brutality, unequal treatment of the justice center, system. I mean, we've talked about some of these. Right. And and the other thing about the civil rights movement, it, because it was so effective and, and uh, uh, it's such an important moment in American history, just about every other marginalized or oppressed group, not just here in America, but throughout the world, has used it as a model, right? Because they were yes. so successful. Right. Well, so let's, uh, heard enough from us, let's bring on uh, Joyce Ladner and, and Jenna and hear what she has to say. This is Jenna Spinelli here today with Dr. Joyce Ladner. Dr. Ladner, thanks for joining us on Democracy Works. I'm pleased to be here. Um, so we're going to kind of take a a tour today, a trip back through your your time in the civil rights movement, maybe get your, your reflections on some of where things stand today. Um, but going back to the beginning, uh, I know you and your sister Dory got involved in the, the movement very early on when, when you were in high school. Um, what was the, the kind of catalyst for you? The catalyst for us was Emmett Till and the, the lynching of the 14-year-old Emmett Till in uh, the Delta of Mississippi. 
So that was the clarion call for my generation of Southern blacks, young people to get involved. And so what, how did, how did that, that make you feel and how did, how did you translate those feelings into your, your actions? I remember feeling very, very, very powerless back then. Uh, I felt that I'd been slapped down um, and sh- into an area, kind of abyss, where I should be very, very frightened. Um, it was not your garden variety of racism. This went far, far beyond. So um, later, and I had high hopes that they would prosecute the people who were found um, to have been to have lynched him, um, and that was not to be. But I, my real sort of visceral reaction came when I saw the photograph of Emmett Till on the cover of Jet Magazine, where, as you know, his mother refused to allow the funeral directors to do any cosmetic work on his face. And here's a kid who had been uh, dumped into the Tallahatchie River, uh, and he was bloated, and they gouged one of his eyes out. And yet Mrs. Till, by the way, had to fight to get his body released from the state of Mississippi. They had gone ahead and buried her child. She got there from Chicago. She finally got him back and took him to New to uh, Chicago uh, for the funeral and, and wake and viewing. And she said she didn't ha- allow him, them to change his, the way he looked when she saw him. She wanted the world. She said, I wanted the world to see what they had done to my baby. And that photograph and all its grotesques um made us made me feel that I had to one day do something. I didn't know how, but I knew I had to do it. Later when I became a member of Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee or SNCC, and just talking to my friends, every one of us had been influenced by that photograph. And I mean you, you did you think this could be me, this could be my brothers, this Absolutely. could be I thought it could be my brothers. I had um, younger brothers, and I said the same thing could happen to them. And I remember my mother drawing my... My brother was maybe eight years old, so but she kept an eye on them. You had to be close to the house. Um, and that occurred even more so when Mac Charles Parker was lynched in a, at Poplarville, Mississippi, when I was um, 15 or 16. And Poplarville was just a few miles from Hattiesburg. Today it would be about 15 minutes on the interstate. Mother kept my brother very close, um, my, all my brothers, but particularly my older brother she, and, she, and my father. She worried a lot about my father being lynched. And it didn't help that the woman who said she was um, raped by Mac Parker lived in little town called Petal, which was a part of Hattiesburg where I grew up. And you were also in school when the, the Brown v. Board of Education decision came down, right? I was. I was, what, 12, let me see, 11 years old. Let me see. Came out in 54. I was born in 43. So I was 11. I remember the older people talking about it, and particularly my, my great uncle, Archie, who had fought in World War I and was very politically aware and a real race man because he praised the achievements, celebrated the achievements of African Americans. He talked about, he also talked, he talked about the 54 decision, but they also talked about that young preacher over there in Alabama in Montgomery. And those colored people have not been on those buses for months and Sundays, as they would say. And that's why we should stay off the buses here. Mm-hmm. It was that, I was the child, but I re- those conversations resonated with me. I remember them still. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, in terms of, of action or kind of substantive change, did, did you see any changes or were, were any no. uh, integration efforts made in your school? No, what happened in the Deep South was that uh, the southern states, immediately after the, the Brown decision came down, rushed to build new schools for black children. So we got a new school 
But in the meantime, the consequences were that they closed, I guess, three schools and bust all those children to my school, to the big school near my house. I could walk a block to school, and I had friends who got on the bus at 6 o'clock in the morning in order to get there. That was the inequity. But they felt that by building new schools that they could stave off integration. We still got the secondhand books, by the way. They had me down books after four years in the white school. Then they passed them to us. We never had new books. So I understand that uh, Medgar Evers played a, a key role in, in, in you uh, getting involved in the, the movement in high school. Um, can you talk about what that was like, your first impressions and, and his influence? Medgar, I met when he came to Hattiesburg, when we established, Mr. Damer and Clyde Kennard established the Hattiesburg Youth, NAACP Youth Council. That was about 1958, so I was about 14, 10th grade or so. But I had met him earlier in those years when they would take us to Jackson to these exciting meetings where I saw all these pe- black people in Mississippi who wanted freedom like a little child that I wanted. And I saw high school students who also wanted freedom. And it was the most remarkable thing. What I didn't know at the time was that I saw the police out writing down something, but they were taking, writing down the, the tag numbers and making models of cars. So the county they were registered to so they could call sheriffs in those towns to make sure that they were punished. People lost their jobs because of that, threatened because of it, homes burned because of it, their attendance. So if you want to talk about democracy, this was certainly a, a failure of any basic protections. I was very close to Medgar when I went to college. My sister and I used to go up the street to his office. This was Jackson State College. And we were eventually expelled because we organized a demonstration Mecca had told us was going to take place. Uh, he told us to keep it quiet. Yeah, and so, yeah. And I actually wanted to ask you about that. So, you know, you being expelled by the, the college for the actions you've taken, it seems in some ways that the pendulum on college campuses might have be swinging in the exact opposite direction direction now where students on on some campuses are almost expecting universities to step in and and protect them from ideas they they don't agree with or they they make them feel uncomfortable as from from your background and also your your career in in higher education what what do you make of this it was very different then because we knew that the state supported colleges public colleges were not going to uh, tolerate uh, protests and so on because they were strictly under the thumb of of the governor, state legislature, <clears throat> who were you know opposed to desegregation. Um, but the s- terrible thing that happened to us was that uh, students at nearby Tougaloo College staged the first sit-in in Mississippi at the public library. That evening, we had a protest uh, was simply the prayer meeting, actually, the most benign thing one could do in front of the public, in front of the university college library. Um, Emmett Burns, who was a, a student but also a minister in training, was in the middle of his prayer, literally in the middle of his prayer, when we heard these, this voice shouting like, what are you doing? Stop this. Break it up. And we turned and we saw that it was the college president, Jacob Reddix, who came with his arms flailing, and he was just literally out of control. He was, didn't know what to do. He came upon my two roommates and me, and he grabbed my roommate Eunice by the shoulder and knocked her to the ground, then sent her to sent the dean over to the dorm that night to tell her she was expelled and had to be out by daybreak. Those were the atrocious kinds of things that happened back then. So in, my, in that era, we had to force the university to take a, take a stand on behalf of us. Um, and we fought them vigorously um, when they didn't, and frequently it was they did not, as evidenced by the protests all over the country. One last question here kind of about schooling. Um, we talk a lot in conversations about democracy about the, the decline of civics education and oh, that being a problem today. I'm wondering what what your civics education was like and, and what what you think is, is missing from, from how these, these things are being taught today. We 
um, took high school history and social science, civics, uh, ostensibly to become good citizens in a state where we were not allowed, we were second class. <laughs> um, but we were informed, um, provided us with a knowledge base and also certain kinds of ethics and values about what democracy was about, American democracy, even if we had none in Mississippi. I think that one of the worst things that's happened in, in subsequent years is the decline of, of civics education and of a lot of so, social science type courses. Um, the social sciences have suffered tremendously. Um, and, and, you know, just as music is not taught in schools, I mean, just a number of courses that would make one a round, well-rounded person. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, so, how did you how did you reconcile those things? Kind of learning about these ethics and these values, but yet knowing that in some ways, as you said, they they didn't apply no. to you. Well, my sister was one who argued a lot. She she would argue in in uh, history class that uh, we're not citizens, and the Thirteenth and Fourteenth Amendment to amendments to the Constitution. Um the intent has not been realized because we remain second-class citizens. Um, and the professor didn't argue back, I mean, because he, his name was Mr. Fowler, Willie Flat Fowler. He was constrained by the fact that he couldn't come out sounding like a rabbit radical in class. Um, so he walked a tightrope. We're seeing all kinds of movements today, and I, one one in particular I'd, I'd like to get your thoughts on is the Black Lives Matter movement. So, uh, how do you view their their organizing principles and and how they're they're approaching things? I think um, Black Lives Matter is to this generation what SNCC was to my generation, the, and I think also that Trayvon Martin was to this generation what Emmett Till was to mine. Mm-hmm. And here you had a case of obviously of a young man who was just shot and murdered. And the response to it was a national outpouring of anger, and eventually that anger was channeled by um, young people, both college college students and non-college students, I should say, is the case. In a manner that was very similar, I was transported in time back to when we protested horrible conditions. So I was so excited, so excited to see Finally, we have some movement activity. And I was never one to criticize students for not caring because I think people care in different ways, but I think that ever so often there's a catalytic force, a catalytic agent that causes people to erupt. And I also believe in something like the levity of the universe in a way. We can go so far overboard in one area that eventually, you know, in a democratic society, it's not going to stay all like it is now with democracy being under great assault in this administration, there would be some reckoning with it, and it may be with the next election. Mm-hmm. So I, I know you were also very much involved in the, the March on Washington. Yes. And I, so I, I've read that that was very much a, a male-dominated a movement. So, so what, what was your role, and how did you feel about the kind of gender dynamics that were at play there? Well, I was 19 years old. Uh, the way I came to work on the March on Washington was that A. Philip Randolph and Byrett Rustin, A. Philip Randolph was the principal organizer, the chairman, and Byrett was the um, director of the march. Uh, they put out a call for each civil rights wor- organization to send two people to work on the march. Cortland Cox, who was a student at Howard, and, and I went. We were sent by SNCC. So I went to... Uh, we organized that march in less than a month. It was done with breakneck speed. I wasn't aware of the gender dynamics because it most of the there were few women who had emerged as civil rights leaders, very very few. I often say that that when I, I'm asked that question in a critical way, like why didn't you people do, stand up and protest? You can't impose the kind of 2020 uh, perspective onto the way people thought about things back then. Dorothy Hythe, 
head of the National Council of Negro Women was one, and Anna Arnold Hedgeman were the two women who were involved in the march. They were they would come around to our office up in Harlem. So I wasn't tuned into. I mean, very few of us were tuned in at that at that level. Um, I wanted to, to talk with you about voter suppression. Uh, oh yes. <laughs> um, tell me about your your process to become a registered voter in in the state of Mississippi. I tried to register. Just to vote three times in Hattiesburg. I failed the voter registr- literacy test three times. Uh, it was because uh, Theron Lynn, who was the county regist- forest county registrar, failed all black people who came before him. Only a handful got through. Uh, at the same time, he hand- he registered all white people. He said he used to take the phone directory and just call people and say, you're now registered to vote. I was required to write essays on two questions. One was an interpretation of a section in the U.S. Constitution. And I know I did well on it. You know. At least I knew what, that, what the Constitution was. And I was to analyze or state the duties of a good citizen. On the third attempt, I knew I was going to flunk anyway. So I wrote that a good citizen is one who obeys just laws and disobeys unjust laws. I mean, I was, at that point, I was just, you know, teed off. And, and so Theron Lynn took, I told, signaled to him, see, it was like a counter here, and you stood there, and he had and answered the question while standing, and he was there behind the desk, the, the counter. He took my, I signaled that I'm, I'm finished. He came over and jerked it from my hand and started looking at what I'd written and then he'd look over at me and roll his eyes at me, like, how dare she do this? <laughs> then he called his secretary over to take a look. And as he consulted with her, and as he was getting redder and more and more angry, I just waved at him, <laughs> like, hi, how's it going? And he, then he came over and told me, well, you failed. And I said, I knew that. And I walked out. What did what what reason, if any, did did he give? Did give he make a, up? Yeah, I never gave ans- reasons. He just said you you failed to pass this test. You didn't answer these questions adequately. At least they didn't ask me like they did in a lot of places in the state. How many bubbles are in a bar of soap, <laughs> oh or how many grains of sand are in a jar? That's what some people had to go through. Um, and once the other part of the law in some places was that once if you pass that part. Of, the test, then you had to get, oh, your name was published in the in the newspaper. The re- logic was, they said, or the reason was, they said that any registered voter could challenge you for your moral fitness. Oh, my <laughs> These goodness. These people were crazy. They were absolutely insane. I can only imagine what would happen if that was uh, still on the books today or what. what I mean, it, it seems like the, the, the tactics have changed, but it, it, in some ways that, that same mindset is still there. If you look at how they treated people in, in North Carolina, where um, they, they took uh, absentee ballots to them and, and told them they would fill, fill out certain parts of them. Um, but the re- you know the real reason they ran people's names in the paper? So that whoever they worked for and other quite power, powerful fathers in the uh, white fathers in that community could then, and Ku Klux Klan, they could be attacked. They could uh, lose their jobs. Like it, it was like saying that here's what this man you who works for you is doing, you know. And people did. Some people were beaten, homes burned. I mean, it was, it was atrocious. And the Justice Department eventually back in, and retroactively registered all those people he had turned down. By then, I was off in graduate school in, 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 at Washington University of St. Louis, so I, I never voted in Mississippi because it, over time I didn't return to live there, although I had planned to when I left. I said, so um, So I never voted in Mississippi, but I did not vote any place else either until that um, ruling came down from the Justice Department. Was there a, a, a through line or something that, that united all the, the, the different organizing that you did, whether for civil rights or voting rights or, or all of those activities? Well, in the South, the, 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 the phrase we always used was, why are you doing this? And we said freedom. 
and that was um, that remained the case until later people began to say that we were doing this to desegregate. They they came up with different different um, uh, mantras in a way, I mean, uh, answers in a way, but we you know the freedom songs that we sang everything was geared toward the concept of, of freedom. Equality was later added in, but freedom remained the constant. And and do you feel you got it, or you 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 no? We realized some some uh, achievements, particularly voter voter uh, the voting rights bill in '65 was a major achievement because voting the whole act and process of organizing and of trying to get people to vote. We registered very few voters, very few people. Uh, nevertheless, we kept pressing on because we knew eventually there would be a change in the laws. And the the um, Voting Rights Act was indeed a major achievement. The six, uh, 64 uh, Civil Rights Act was another. But the thing is, I never imagined then that we would be back to square one, almost square one, in so many places with the attack on voting. Uh, the changing of laws. It, I mean, the dirty tricks of changing, sending out notices that voting is going to occur on the 9th of November instead of the eighth, the Tuesday, and of um, changing the, the rules so that you can no longer vote on Sunday, uh, like souls to the polls where people from churches would go en masse on church buses to to the polls to vote. Just a, a lot of a lot more tricks <laughs> nowadays than we ever even imagined. But we, we didn't have to imagine it because we couldn't vote to start with. What should people do, knowing you know, knowing what you do, every everything you've you've been through? What what advice would you have to say, young people or or, or anyone who wants to get involved in in, in organizing and and trying to to impact some of what they perceive to be injustices going on around them? Uh, freedom is not free, um, and we had that elusive freedom in some areas for, I uh, call it elusive for a while. Um, but if you look at the way the Voting Rights Act has been attacked um, for so many years now and chipped away at, um, each generation has to fight for those same rights all over again because they're not permanent. We're going to end, as we always do, with our four Mood of the Nation poll questions. So thinking specifically about American politics, what makes you angry? It's righteous indignation I have now um, toward these Republicans in Congress who are willing to subjugate democracy, the Constitution, defy the Constitution by voting, for example, to fund uh, uh, Trump's wall of them going along with, of them allowing their party, the Republican Party, to be reshaped by a charlatan from, from New York who was never successful before now. I am just absolutely angry over, over the way people have abdicated their responsibilities in Congress. Absolutely angry. Um, and uh, what makes you proud? Of the young people who are standing up proudly in Black Lives Matter and all other organizations, whether they're well, this little girl who um, sat in front of the UN each day, you have to remind me of what she was there for, but she was protesting and and uh, she drew a lot of attention to a cause. But what I'm saying is that there are so many young people today who in their own way and on their own issues are standing up. What I'm proud of, if I look back, is that the Civil Rights Movement gave rise to the women's movement, gave rise to... Great Panthers, uh, senior citizens protesting conditions, um, and a host of other organizations began to organize and understood that they could practice democracy with a small d. Yeah. That that I will forever remain uh, be proud of. Right. And uh, what makes you worry? Oh, I worry terribly about the future for young people um, who will not be as prosperous in many cases, as their parents. I worry about, in that regard, I worry about my son and grandson. And I wonder what the future holds for these younger generations who are coming up at a time when their futures are being mortgaged by irresponsible Congress people by adding to this tremendous deficit. 
by uh, having them pay in future years for these fat cats to have been given tax cuts at the expense of their future. And then finally, what gives you hope? Oh, I'm an eternal optimist. I believe in the goodness of each human being. I believe it's there. It's a matter of tapping it to bring it out. Well, hopefully listening to uh, our conversation today, some of your insights, we'll, we'll tap some of that feeling to, to come out on our listeners. So, I think uh, so, and I hope so. Great. Um, Dr. Ladner, thank you so much for joining us. I've enjoyed being here. Well, that was a very interesting interview. And, and, and one of the things that I was hoping Jenna would ask about and that uh, Joyce would talk about, and she did, is this sort of generational issue about mm -hmm. where we, not only where we are now in the civil rights agenda, which we did talk about a bit, uh, but where younger African Americans are in the context of the civil rights Just movement. Just the echoes and, of yeah, the, the same kind of, of oppression and, and um, voter suppression. You know, when you listen to her talk, she starts at a period of time where she had no voting rights, mm -hmm. essentially, right? She was denied three times right. the opportunity to register to vote. So many of these same dimensions of, of voter suppression, of marginalizing the voice of, of African Americans that were uh, practiced overtly in the 60s are, are still out there, right? And she's talking about things that are happening in, in North Carolina, for example, that, um, that if you were... You know, <laughs> you could you could take those same look at that same history and find it very depressing that that these these fights are still being fought. Right. The the only difference is the framing right. around some sort of notion of potential electoral fraud or something like that. Uh, yeah, I'm sure there's a lot of say voter fraud because electoral fraud is what happened in North Carolina. Right. Right. And I'm sure there's a lot of people who would matter. take issue with how I just framed it. But but. You know, it is hard. Well, that not is the context in which she sees it, right? And and it's important to note that mm -hmm. because uh, you know, uh, voter ID laws, for example, or restrictions on voting hours. I mean, if there's one thing and we getting know, rid of Sunday voting, getting one thing we know empirically mm -hmm. about these things is that they are only passed by Republican legislatures. Mm -hmm. And the and and has been been seen in some court cases and in the uh, discussions that some people are responsible. It, it, it there's clearly a racial element, often couched in terms of that the, that well, African Americans support Democrats. So this isn't really about African Americans; it's about Democrats. Mm -hmm, right. But from the perspective of African Americans, as we heard from her, kind of is just a direct line <laughs> from literacy tests to this. Right, and it's and it's it's easy for. A Republican to say this is just uh, partisan fights, but for an African American, it, I can I find it very hard to believe that it se feels that way. Right, and, right. and I think she I think she, she yeah. alluded to that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and that that raises a, a point that I wanted to to bring up. I mean, I have argued in the past that I thought you know the libertarian point of view. Uh, was wrong because it reflected the, the idea that liberty was the overriding value and that other values are not given proper weight by a libertarian point of view. But, the, you know, basically the point is that a, a libertarian says, you know, freedom means being left alone, right? And for, uh, for Joyce, the whole argument behind what do you want from the civil rights movement, the, the, the answer was freedom. freedom. Yeah, and, because, but, because government can be seen as protecting one's freedoms. Right. And and making it making you more free than yes. you were without government. Right. And so so there's another way in which I think Because government can control oppressors. And and can make a climate can create a climate in which your own capacity for self-expression and for, you know, making the most of your God-given talents is more realizable, more possible. Right? Well, well, we were talking about this a little bit before off the air. And, uh, I mean, my understanding of some of Locke's writing is that he's arguing, as did Jefferson, I think, that part of government's responsibility is to protect one's freedoms. Right. I mean, the freedom of property, right? The freedom that you're... But, but property used in a term that means a lot more right. than property does right mm -hmm, now. Mm -hmm. I think that's probably fair. Yeah, right? I mean, right. property in the Lockean sense had to do with happiness, had to do with your work and your labor. I mean, that's why Jefferson sort of twisted it, right? And so it becomes happiness. This was a moment in which we were, we as a nation were forced to examine our fundamental values and ideals, realize that we'd fallen short, and then um, commit as a nation to doing a better job of that. And so... Um, 
it is a post and pre event in which things changed dramatically, meaningfully, and morally in American society. Yeah, although so sometimes not quite as quickly and dramatically not as, quickly as, as we, we think. Like. I mean, she right. talked a little bit there about desegregated schools, and of course, uh, you know, Brown versus Board of Education yeah. passed in 1954, and for the next, what, almost 10 years, up until the Civil Rights Act of 1964, schools remained desegregated. Well, there were all I, kinds of ways to do it. Oh, and I thought you were going to say, and yet right now in 2019, we, we have seen a resegregation. Well, that's right. We've seen a resegregation, and we've seen that resegregation largely in the North, mm -hmm. and not where we're well, not, not where we are accustomed to thinking of. It. Well, it was in the in the, in south the suburbs. Of, yeah, right, right, right. right. Anyway, um, so all to say that. If you are uh, a young person concerned about justice, people like Joyce Ladner are, are people you should um, study and listen to and, and uh, learn about. All right, well, so, great episode. Um, we were, we thank, thanks again to the Africana Research Center for allowing us to take a few moments of, of uh, Dr. Ladner's time and uh, um, thank you to her for her, uh, for her work through history. I'm Michael Berkman. I'm Chris Beam. This has been Democracy Works. Thanks for listening. Democracy Works is produced by the McCourtney Institute for Democracy at Penn State and WPSU Penn State. Our hosts are Michael Berkman, Chris Beam, and me, Jenna Spinelli. Andy Grant is our engineer, and Mark Stitzer is our editor. Additional support comes from Emily Reddy, Shireen Stanford, Craig Johnson, and the rest of the team at WPSU. For detailed show notes and discussion questions for each episode, visit our website at democracyworkspodcast.com. And if you like what you heard today, please consider rating or reviewing us wherever you listen to podcasts. Thanks for listening.